Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Jennifer Walsh, Dean of the College of Environmental Design, and I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening for what uh, will, without doubt, be a compelling lecture by our speaker, Van Jones, um, and our chance to celebrate the 2012 uh, College of Environmental Design Distinguished Alumni. I think that um, the bridge traffic uh, and the downtown traffic was pretty bad, so uh, I think there will be more of us, uh, more visitors uh, arriving all the time, but I don't want us to wait too long before we are able to make awards and, and hear Van, and so I'd like to start. And uh, I would like to just remind everybody, if you have a cell phone, maybe now's the time to make it quiet. Uh, we're really pleased to be at the De Young this year, um, where there are many ties to the college. Uh, former Dean and Professor Harrison Fraker served on the building committee of the museum's board uh, of directors during its construction and played a major role in shaping the project. Uh, CED alums Fong and Chan Architects served as principal architects, and Professor Walter Hood of Hood Design was the landscape architect for the project. So we feel like we have many ties here to the De Young. I'm very pleased also to take this uh, occasion to introduce members of the College uh, Advisory Council. The council is a select group of alumni and friends who care deeply about the college and serve as its ambassadors with fellow CED alumni alumni of the university, and others whose professional and philanthropic interests are close to those of the college. And so I want you to, st it, it's, it got quite dark out there, um, but I want you to stand if you are uh, a member of the, the council. And I think tonight we have uh, the chair of the council, Bob Lalonde, uh, here with us tonight. We have uh, Bill Fain, Keith Helmetag from New York, uh, Paul Wolford, uh, and Sylvia Kwan, and I hope I haven't left anybody out, but I think we, the group is larger, um, but I think those are the folks that are here with us, able to be with us tonight. Um, we had a retreat earlier today um, and had a great debriefing session about yesterday's uh, circus and uh, got lots of ideas for moving the college forward. Uh, I'm also really pleased to see that many of the CED faculty are joining with us in the celebration tonight. And I'd like you all to stand if you're here. Um, faculty, I, I saw Karen and Dana and Mike and Mary and uh, Louise. And um, yesterday at Worcester Hall was day one of the Berkeley Circus and we hosted almost 70 distinguished visiting fellows that spent the afternoon reviewing the work of about 300 of our students um, during research poster sessions, lightning talk sessions, and studio project reviews. Uh, it was really awesome. And many of the students who were recognized at the end of the day for their uh, they're excellent. It was an honor to be uh, participate in the circus because it, we selected uh, from a wider group of work, body of work, um, and those uh, those students, um, additional students, got uh, special recognition um, at the end of the day yesterday for their outstanding work as well. And many of them are here tonight uh, as guests t this evening. So I want to recognize them and ask them to stand. Students, students, stand. My last acknowledgement is to uh, Mary Kakoma and Christine Wang and their team who have done a really fantastic job um, organizing uh, not only a lot of yesterday, uh, and, uh, but also this evening, and also Tim Klein, who was the ringmaster yesterday at the circus. So thank you very much to the staff. I'd like to offer just some very quick news about the college. Um, one thing to say is that the college faculty is growing. We're currently in the midst of three faculty searches, one in the Department of City and Regional Planning, two in the Par Department of Architecture. With these new positions, we will have added 12 new faculty uh, in less than three years. And this year, we welcome Stefano Schaffan uh, into architecture, uh, and also soon to arrive is Christina Hill uh, in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning. 
Our faculty have garnered some important awards recently, and I'll just give you a few examples because they just seem to keep coming in. Professor Ananya Roy, who's here this evening, received the ACSP 2011 Paul Davidoff Book Award for her book, Poverty Capital, Microfinance and the Making of Development. Associate Professor Mark Anderson's firm, Anderson & Anderson, won uh, award, an award from the Wholesome Foundation for their net zero uh, classroom in Hawaii. And Professor Louise Mazingo, who's also here this evening, won the 2011 Prose Award for Architecture and Urban Planning for her book, Pastoral Capitalism, A History of Suburban Corporate Landscapes. And just this week, we learned that the Berkeley student team and their faculty advisor, Peter Bosselman, are finalists in the 2012 ULI Heinz competition. And this is a team chosen from a field of 139 teams across the country from 64 schools. And they're prepping for their final presentation on April 5th. So many good things happening. Turning to the physical home of the college, which many of you, uh, I'm sure, fondly remember. Um, who could forget all that concrete and plywood? Um, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot is happening. We have plans to modernize our fabrication facilities, um, and that effort is through the schematic design phase, and thanks to the incredible generosity of our alumni, Mark Cavaniero and Tom Mead. Uh, our new Worcester Gallery, designed by alumna Anne Fougeron, with lighting designed by architecture professor Lisa Iwamoto, opened in September with a wonderful exhibit on Worcester's residential architecture curated by alumna Caitlin Brostrom and also uh, Professor Emeritus Dick Peters. The, the, lastly, in terms of the, the physical home, uh, we've made important strides in our plans to remodel our cafe. And we're also working on the virtual home of the college, which is increasingly important. And we're about to redesign the college website so that we can take advantage of the many different kinds of platforms that people now use and uh, social networking tools and, uh, and provide a way to tell our story more clearly, to engage visitors and prospective students, uh, and to be a central, the central college forum for discourse, debate, and design. Finally, uh, a few words about college, the, the college financial picture and, the, and philanthropic support for the college, which is increasingly critical now that Cal, as a, as a university, receives less than 11% of its budget from the state's general fund. And I will be on the bus on March 5th going to Sacramento to um, talk to the legislators about that. Um, uh, in addition to our successful summer program, led by Professor Donnell Guthrie, as well as new endowments for scholarships and fellowships, we've been able to provide an important boost in student support. In December, we announced alumnus David Wu's generous gift that established the David K. Wu Chair in the College of Environmental Design. And the Elizabeth Byrne Fund was recently created to celebrate Elizabeth's retirement and 27 years of commitment to the college as head librarian of the Environmental Design Library. And I think Elizabeth's here. Um, I'm not sure. I think I mean, she might be also stuck on the bridge. So um, just a few glimpses of what's happening in the college. Um, I'm happy to give people more information as they would like. Uh, but now I'd like to move uh, on to this evening's program. One of the main reasons that we're here tonight is to celebrate a tradition of recognizing CED alumni for outstanding achievements in their professional careers. Since 1998, when uh, then-Dean Harrison Fraker uh, started, with Peter Dodge, started this wonderful tradition, 62 alumni have received the College of Environmental Design Distinguished Alumnus Award. And so it's my pleasure to add three members to that illustrious group tonight. Um, I'd like to start by inviting Bill Fain to the stage, please. Bill has dedicated his professional life to designing spaces and places that advance the practice of architecture uh, and urban design. He strives to address the urban challenges that confront the world's cities, and even suggests that a building should be in some way incomplete, so that only as it gathers with other buildings to, sh uh, other buildings to shape a public space does it begin to participate in something more meaningful and complete. Boston Globe architecture critic Robert Campbell states, no one knows more than Bill Fain about the problems that beset the world's cities. But Fain welcomes every problem as a learning experience. He's convinced that with enough common sense and fellow feeling, we'll do better. 
Bill's work involves large-scale projects that are necessarily interwoven with the critical issues of contemporary urban design and placemaking, such as job creation, transportation, and transit, housing, and public open space. The work has been worldwide with projects across the US, Asia, and the Middle East. A native Californian, Bill earned his BA, BR, in, uh, in, from Berkeley, um, in, and has also his, took his MARC at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. In the early 1970s, he's worked as an urban designer um, in New York Mayor John Lindsay's Urban Design Group in Manhattan, and then as a senior architect and urban designer for the Boston Redevelopment Authority, later moving to work on federal new town programs for HUD in Washington. And then he had the good sense to come back west, uh, where he joined William Pereira Associates in 1980 as director of urban design, and then partnered with Scott Johnson to form Johnson Fain in 1987. For the last 25 years, he's served as director of urban design and planning, as well as managing partner in an office of 70 architects, planners, and interior designers in downtown Los Angeles, right across from the LA River. LA River. It's a fabulous office. Bill's received many honors and awards, including National Endowment for the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities Awards, uh, and also the Rome Prize. And he's also won important competitions. These, the prizes include the AI, include AIA awards for his 300-acre Mission Bay Master Plan, currently being implemented and widely seen as a major success. His winning scheme for Beijing's Central Business District provided uh, for more than 12 million square uh, meters of mixed-use urban development and was implemented prior to the, the 2008 Olympic uh, Games. Another competition winner was the Jing Wang Newtown Master Plan in central Shanghai. Um, designed for 100,000 people, the plan set new standards for the region, emphasizing sustainable transit-served development. Bill's work has been published and exhibited widely, and I especially want to call out his award-winning Los Angeles Greenway concept plan. It, uh, that's a plan that was a major inspiration to me as an urban planner, and it led me to assign literally hundreds of undergraduates in Los Angeles to read, it, to read the work. Um, and I, I imagine that, like me, many of them have that in their mind still. The concept proposed reusing river and flood control channel, channels, former red car rights of way, power, ease, power line easements, and recent metro line segments as open space connectors. And many of these, this was really a prescient plan, and many of these opportunities have been incorporated into the LA City General Plan, and they also underpin a lot of the planning for the Los Angeles River. Bill served as a Friedman professor at Berkeley. He's also taught at, Har at Harvard and SciArc. And uh, I would suggest that you might want to look for his forthcoming book, If Cars Could Talk, Essays on Urbanism. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I can't tell you how honored I am, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jennifer uh, and the school, uh, the college, uh, for this incredible uh, honor. Uh, you know, every day uh, I realize that my Berkeley education uh, uh, has deeply affected me, and uh, it's not just uh, uh, sort of everyday living, but it's a critical uh, work that I do. And uh, I'm an architect that actually became an urban designer in private practice. And uh, the, uh, the, the, just the thinking process, uh, ideas, creativity, it all comes forward. And uh, I, was, uh, I was educated here in the 60s, if some of you remember that. And uh, that was quite a, an interesting time at Berkeley. And, what was interesting, uh, just in the last day or so, because we reviewed the students' work, and I was very interested in to see if it was critical and it was, uh, it was, uh, highly pointed towards uh, critical issues. And I have to tell you, uh, the last day, I thought that the work is actually better than in some ways. Because uh, at the time I entered the college, uh, they changed it from the architecture school to the College of Environmental Design. So there was an idea about environmental issues. And today, it's amazing, because there's actually more information on how to deal with these. And you see it in the students' work. It's coming forward. They use research in, in uh, very uh, significant ways. Uh, just to, to recognize um, uh, a very important uh, person uh, that I've worked with is Scott Johnson, uh, my partner, business partner in Los Angeles, who is also a graduate of the school. And uh, we, uh, we teamed up at uh, the uh, Harvard uh, Graduate School during 
the, the 70s. And then, strangely enough, we ended up in Los Angeles to trans, uh, transition the prayer firm. But what was great about him is he, he has allowed and worked with me in developing uh, a platform to do urban design and private practice. It's unusual because research is so much a part of urban design and planning, so uh, that is very important. And uh, a lot of developers don't like to pay for research. Uh, 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 another very important uh, recognition here is uh, I'd like to recognize my wife, Jennifer. And, uh, and uh, I always like, like to think of her as the one that has the smarts in the family. And uh, I, uh, she's uh, supported me all these years. We've been 34, uh, married for 34 years. And she likes to term herself uh, the architect of the family. Now, you, may, you might not understand that, but I have two daughters who are both architects. And, uh, and, uh, so, uh, and they married two architects. So it, it gets kind of uh, crazy, especially for an older guy at dinner uh, when you're asked all these questions and challenged. But uh, uh, I would just like to, to uh, again, uh, thank everybody. Uh, for coming, and uh, thanks to school, and thank you, Jennifer, for this honor. Thank, thank you. you I'd like to now uh, invite Shelley uh, Pachika to come down to the stage. Shelley holds a master's degree in city planning from Berkeley and a, ma a Bachelor of Arts from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And she currently serves as the Director of the Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. At HUD, Shelley is responsible for advancing housing and communities that promote affordable, livable, and sustainable living environments. She also provides technical and policy support for energy, green building, and integrated housing and transportation programs at HUD and around the nation. She leads HUD's interagency efforts with the, Department, uh, the, for, with the Department of Transportation and the Environmental Protection Agency um, that is working to improve access to affordable housing, provide more transportation options, and lower transportation costs while protecting the environment in communities nationwide. The office is a really innovative organization that breaks down institutional barriers, encourages cross-disciplinary planning, gives disadvantaged groups a voice in the planning process, and serves to introduce methods of a more sustainable urbanism to major federal agencies that exert a powerful influence on the form and evolution of America's cities and regions. Uh, a well-respected expert in growth management and urban policy, Shelley's been a prime mover in educating policymakers and the public about transit-oriented development. In San Francisco, uh, the Bay Area, she was responsible for the first transit-oriented development policy, TOD policy, that conditions the allocation of new transit funds on good land use planning. She also worked in Denver with the city and transit agency on uh, TOD typology and strategic planning in the Twin Cities to educate a broad coalition of community, business, and government groups about the value of focusing uh, the region's growth on neighborhoods served by transit, and in Seattle, where she helped define a funding program for construction of a new streetcar. Shelley calls herself a startup expert, I think, right? Um, she served as president and CEO of Reconnecting America, a new organization when she took it on, where she be became a national leader for the reform of land use and transportation planning and policy with the goal of creating more sustainable and equitable development, and where she served as founding co-chair of the Transportation for America campaign. Prior to joining Reconnecting America, she was uh, executive director for, of the Congress for the New Urbanism, another new organization. Um, and in this role, she guided the organization's growth into a national coalition with a prominent voice in national debates on urban revitalization, growth policy, and sprawl. And in particular, she focused the coalition on key initiatives that addressed inner city revitalization, mixed income housing, infill development techniques, environmental pres preservation, alternative transportation, and real estate finance reform. Shelley's written widely about community, contemporary, sorry, contemporary planning and sustainable urbanism, and especially transit. And she's paying, playing a really pivotal role in bringing new ideas from city and regional planning to a national audience of policymakers and practitioners. A creative innovator, she's moved city and regional planning from the margins of HUD uh, to its center. And in so doing, she brings great credit to the planning profession, and I should say follows in a major uh, uh, tradition in the College of Environmental Design of 
uh, faculty working and contributing to HUD, as you know. So congratulations, Thank Shelley. You. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much. This is a really terrific honor. It's wonderful to see friends and, and colleagues and former professors here. Um, I would mostly like to thank my family, my husband, Paul Batlin, also an alum of CED, has been an incredible support in all of this work, a real thinker in the same field. And he had the courage to move across the country to Washington, D.C., which is a world unto itself, which we're both <laughs> getting used to. I also have my father, Otto Patisha, a professor of architecture at the University of Oregon, my mother, Sharon Patisha, my mother-in-law, Fran Batlin, and not least of which, my twin daughters who are turning 14 this weekend, Hannah and Rivka. And I would just say that uh, without that level of support, I don't think that I would have had the opportunity to do this kind of work. It's really exciting, the amount of uh, energy and enthusiasm that we're seeing in, in this field of sustainable communities. Um, the work uh, is extraordinarily interdisciplinary, which I think is very much a hallmark of uh, UC Berkeley's uh, program here, and it's always been at the core of my interest in this field. And it's extraordinarily exciting being able to go around the country and talk to people from all different walks of life, all different kinds of communities, people who are really concerned about the quality of life in their communities, and they're really having an opportunity to do something about it. So it's been a honor to be able to be part of this administration and the work that it's doing. So thank you again. Thank you to the college. It's been really wonderful. Thank you. I'd like now to invite John Wong up to the podium. John Wong received his Bachelor of Arts in Landscape Architecture with honors and a Master of Landscape Architecture in Urban Design from the Graduate School of Design. Uh, he was also awarded the Rome Prize in Landscape Architecture from the American Academy in Rome. John is an internationally renowned landscape architect with considerable and diverse design experience in North America and Asia and also the Middle East. He's currently a principal designer and managing principal for the SWA Group Sausalito office, and he also serves in the capacity of chairman of the board for the firm. He's a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects and the Institute of Urban Design and an active member of ULI. His design work has been published very widely. Before joining SWA in 1976, John designed, oh sorry, since joining SWA in 1976, John designed and directed an array of prominent and sustainable projects, including designing and planning of new communities and cities, urban mixed use commercial and office complexes, hospitality resorts and hotels, corporate and educational campuses, civic, medical and residential projects, and, um, and also he's uh, designed the landscapes for major high rise complexes and urban districts and crafted uh, public plazas and gardens throughout the world. So the breadth of the work that John's done is nothing short of amazing. He's collaborated with some of the most renowned architects in North America, including those at SOM, Gensler, Pay Partnership, Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill, James uh, K.M. Chang, Bing Tom Architects, and many others. He's particularly noted for his work on the groundscapes for some of the world's tallest buildings, including the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, Shanghai Tower and North Bund, Magnolia Plaza in Shanghai, uh, two Greenland financial centers in uh, Nanjing and Wuhan, Wuhan, and other towers in China, Korea, and Taiwan. And I have to tell you, John, I was able to go up to the very top of the Burj in, before it was finished in a cage elevator. And um, I really wanted to look at the landscape, but it was really too scary to look down. Uh, so, uh, 
<laughs> That's right. I'll just see the movie. Um, John has won over 90 awards and design competitions, especially for his work in higher education and, ma and major civic buildings. For example, John's contributed enormously to the Stanford campus, um, where his projects include the Alumni Center, the Green Library, the Cantor Center for the Visual, uh, Visual Arts, and the Department of Physical Education and Recreation. Similarly, his work has reshaped the landscape of Tokyo University, Cornell, UC Davis, UC Santa Cruz, UCSF, uh, and, uh, and others. And he's also led, uh, he also led the landscape design for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. John served as a studio lecturer and visiting Ferrand professor at the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning, and he's also been a visiting critic um, at the GSD. He, contributes, uh, he continues to contribute to the college and to Cal, where he serves as uh, a member of the university's design review committee. Um, as his peers wrote uh, when he was in, inducted as a fellow into the ASLA in 2005, um, the reviewers said, and I quote, John is a rare combination of raw talent and rational thought. The many landscapes he has created are artful and thoughtful, and each responds specifically to its site and social role. From the thought-provoking and sculptural Tokyo University to the contextual and healing landscapes at Stanford, his work is aesthetically, socially, and environmentally appropriate. So uh, I want to congratulate you, John. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, this is uh, a very humbling experience, and, and it's a great honor. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for the College of Environmental Design, and as well as all the faculties, as well as uh, everyone who's been contributing to the success of the college. I really deeply appreciate this honor. Uh, I'd just like to say a few uh, words and thank you for those who kind of uh, allow me to, to be here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, my family, uh, my wife, uh, Mildred, who's sitting there, along with my twin daughters also, <laughs> my two teenage twin daughters, Alison and Nicole, and so you have companies. <laughs> uh, they've been the probably the greatest support uh, of uh, my uh, interests and my work, uh, partly because a lot of time I uh, spend my time on airplane quite a bit, as you can tell, in terms of doing work around the world. Uh, so they've been not only uh, provide the love that I need, but also the support, so I really thank you for, for that. The other few individuals I'd like to mention, uh, it's, uh, first of all, uh, in my early uh, start at uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, one of the professors who's no longer here, Michael Laurie, for those of you who still remember him, uh, he was the one who actually uh, taught me to stay in landscape architecture, because I was ready to walk down the hall to do architecture. And so th I thank him for that, because he gave me every example that why I should be a landscape architect, and for good reasons, I'm glad he did that. The other person that have uh, done a lot of uh, uh, support uh, through my years was Peter Walker, who was also formerly a recipient of this award. And I have the opportunity to work with him, uh, mentor under him, and collaborate with him. So I uh, thank him for that. And then finally, uh, I want to thank um, my partners at SWA Group, uh, Calvin Platt, Bill Calloway, and Bill's also a former recipient of the, uh, this uh, award, and, uh, and also my partners, who basically challenge me every day at my work uh, and allow me to uh, really collaborate and, and really provide a lot of uh, thoughtful thinking that put into my work, and so I really deeply appreciate it, and they basically help shape me uh, in terms of uh, give me the sources and the, uh, the innovation that, that I need to sustain in, within this, with this practice. So with that, I uh, thank you and thank you very much. Thanks, well, I, th I think that, that uh, it was wonderful to hear from everybody as well as be able to um, 
uh, give everybody medals, and I want all the distinguished alumni to remember that you have something, that you have to take that medal home in. So uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Van Jones. Van Jones is president and co-founder of Rebuild the Dream, a pioneering new initiative to restore good jobs and economic opportunity. Van has a 15-year track record as a successful, innovative, and award-winning social entrepreneur. He's the co-founder of three thriving nonprofit organizations, the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, The Color of Change, and Green for All, an organization that, that uh, for one of the first times ever, linked social economic and economic justice with the clean energy economy. And he's auth the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Green Collar Economy, which is one of the most uh, important recent books on green jobs. Van has been recognized widely for his thoughtful and creative work. The World Economic Forum named Van a young global leader in uh, 2008. Five, and in uh, a couple years later, in 2008, Fast Company uh, magazine said he had one of the 12 most creative minds on Earth, which is really, um, I don't know, it's hard to know what to think about that. Um, that's pretty amazing. Uh, uh, Time Magazine named him uh, a global environmental hero in 2008 and went on to name him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2009. Um, he's also the recipient of the, uh, the, international, the prestigious International Ashoka Fellowship. Um, and I'm proud to say that one of my last acts at the University of Southern California before I came to Berkeley was to award Van the University's Sustainability Champion Award. Uh, Van's a, a Yale-educated attorney. Um, and he worked as uh, the Green Jobs Advisor to the uh, Obama White House in 2009. And uh, in the White House, he helped run the interagency process that oversaw $80 billion in recovery spending allocation to green uh, economy initiatives and programs. And that was a, a really important step forward. Recently, during the last academic year, Van taught environmental policy and politics at Princeton University. Today, back in the Bay Area, Van serves on the boards of several major organizations, including the National Resource Defense Council, NRDC, and Robert F., the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights. He's also a fellow, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and uh, the American Progress Action Fund. Van is one of this country's leading champions of smart solutions to create pathways out of poverty and to rebuild America's middle class. Uh, and his talk tonight is Rebuild the Dream, the Next American Economy. Van. Well, I am honored and excited to be here. I especially want to uh, honor the award recipients. We should give them another round of applause for the extraordinary work that they've been doing. Um, I want to talk about uh, the design of our democracy, uh, which is a, the big design in which all the other designs fit. Uh, many of you here either are already accomplished or are students about to go out and accomplish great things in designing and redesigning our buildings, our landscapes, and our cities. But all of that design work will fit inside of bigger systems. Uh, the design of our energy system, uh, the design of our food system. Uh, and there are big changes afoot uh, and there's a struggle going on in our country to figure out exactly how, in this new century, those bigger systems are going to function. Uh, when we think about uh, how we're going to repower or reimagining how we power our buildings and our machines, uh, that's called the clean energy revolution. There's a whole discussion going on in the country right now about that. When we think about how we might redesign and rethink our food system, that's called the organic food or natural food, and now they call it the real food revolution. And that's a big discussion as the agricultural uh, bill comes up. And those big discussions will determine uh, how the design of our buildings and the design of, of, our, of our cities uh, takes place. And all that's inside of a bigger thing called democracy. And I think right now, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, you have to be concerned about the state of our democracy. Uh, the ecological crisis 
uh, is proceeding uh, apace. I don't have to tell anybody here about the really horrifying numbers that we're seeing coming from our climate scientists, from those concerned about species diversity, that every single indicator uh, from the ecological side, uh, every week the numbers are worse. Every report is worse than the one before. So there's a, an acceleration of the crisis and yet a deceleration of democratic response. And this is the great challenge in the 21st century. Uh, and we are uh, forced now to deal with this uh, bizarre discussion which poses this dilemma for all of us here. Who do we love more, our children or our grandchildren? Who do we love more, our children or our grandchildren? The, 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 the mainstream media and the political discussion would have us believe if you love your children, then you should grow the economy, grow it now, make sure we have plenty of jobs uh, so we can put food on the table for our kids now, uh, grow the economy using whatever means necessary, don't worry about the ecological consequences, and your children will have a great life. It's just that your grandchildren won't have a planet. Uh, but don't worry about that. Uh, or, to the contrary, if you love your grandchildren and want them to have a good planet to live on, then don't develop anything, don't build anything. Uh, everybody just stay really still. <laughs> your grandkids will have a great planet, it's just your children will starve, right? Don't worry about that. Clearly, this is a false dilemma. But it is a dilemma that has ha completely hamstrung our national government. So that any effort to do anything about our grandchildren and the ecology gets gunned down as job-killing uh, environmentalism. And yet, all too often, efforts to create economic opportunity get gunned down as planet-killing greed. And this is just not going to work. So. I want to talk about how it is that we can hopefully move forward together and uh, build an economy and a democracy and, de and, and design American society in a way that we can love both our children and our grandchildren. And the simple insight here is that rather than thinking about jobs versus the environment, we might just remember that everything that is good for the environment is a job. Solar panels don't put themselves up. That's somebody's job. It's a contract. It's an entrepreneurial opportunity. Uh, buildings don't retrofit and weatherize themselves and put in their own uh, new boilers and furnaces and insulation. That's somebody's job or a contract or entrepreneurial opportunity. Uh, uh, trees don't even plant themselves anymore <laughs> in industrial society. Even planting trees is somebody's job. So there is a, a, an area of hope that we can begin to aim for where we begin to put people back to work, uh, doing the work that most needs to be done, which is repowering America, retrofitting America, making sure our country can actually uh, uh, be a part of the solution for the Earth's problems and not uh, a driver of ecological catastrophe. But how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, before I give you some of the things I've learned in my journey, which I hope will help all of you, uh, I want to say three things. One about you, one about my father, and one about brownie boxes. Equally important, all three. About you, you are going to have to, as people who really understand that a lot of the ecological design that may seem strange to people is actually quite practical, actually can save uh, folks money and be beautiful, you're going to have to explain that, especially the students here to a more and more attentive set of audiences. This whole discussion about the environment has gotten very heated. Uh, it's no longer something just on the edges. It's right in the center of, of American politics now. So you are going to have to explain yourself. And those of you who are professionals will, will agree with me. You have to explain yourself to more and more kinds of people. I want to share with you some ways to do that, seven ways to do that. Before I do that, I want to give you some of my biases. First my dad and then the brownie boxes. 
uh, I get excited when I come to stuff like this because I look at graduates who done something extraordinary with their education. And it reminds me of my father, uh, who passed away uh, three years ago this month. Uh, he was the first person in our family to go to college. Uh, he was born in abject poverty. Uh, he grew up in a place called Orange Mound, Memphis. Uh, any Southerners here? A few, a few. Uh, anybody here ever been to Orange Mound? <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> you never know. Uh, it was the biggest uh, ghetto, for lack of a better term, in the country until Harlem overtook it in the 40s. And my dad grew up there, very poor. Uh, joined the military in the middle of a conflict to get out. Uh, I always thought that was kind of weird. <laughs> I've got to get to a better neighborhood. <laughs> it's too dangerous around here. Uh, but he did. He joined the military in the middle of a conflict. Um, got out, put himself through college put his little brother through college, put a cousin through college, put me through college, put my sister through college, uh, became an educator in our home county, uh, principal of a junior high school, and helped a ton of poor kids, low-income kids, get out of poverty before he died. My dad, when I went off to Yale for law school, that was a one of his happiest days. But he was worried about me. He was worried about me for a simple reason. He noticed that I was no longer able to wear my hats because my head <laughs> immediately <laughs> upon admission <laughs> to the law school was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and after the hats, the, the door became difficult to navigate. And um, even the carport after a while. So he took me outside. And of course, my relatives were not helping. Uh, you got any, any first time grad, grad, any people first in their family go to grad school? See, your, your, your relatives don't help. Because they start bragging on you. And they start telling you how great you are. It just gets worse and worse. So my dad took me out, outside, away from the rest of the family. He said, listen, son, I want to tell you something. I'm proud of you. You're about to go someplace that when I was your age, because of the color bar, I wouldn't even have been allowed on the campus. And you're going to go there as a student. I'm proud of you. And I accept a couple of things. I accept that when you come home for Christmas, you're going to be smarter than me. You're going to have learned things that I don't know. And I'm going to be learning from you now. You're going to be smart than me when you come home. That's good. I'm proud of you. But son, there's only two kind of smart people in this world. The smart people who take very simple things and make them sound very complicated <laughs> so they can enrich themselves. And there's smart people who take very complicated things and make them sound very simple so they can empower everybody else. Next time I see you, I want you to be that kind of smart guy. Taking that as my marching orders, I said, yes, sir. And my whole career, I've tried to figure out how to take very complicated things and make them simple. And I thought this was just because it was good for, for me and, and, and keeping with my father's tradition. But I also, once I became a parent, I really learned the necessity of this. Does anybody here have any children? <laughs> Just checking. Anybody ever met any children? <laughs> okay, now I'm, that's called being inclusive, you see. Um, I have two boys. Anybody have two children? <laughs> Did anybody have them in the house at the same time? <laughs> Not recommended. <laughs> uh, I have two boys. One is three, one is seven. Um, they are their own little mess, but never more so than when we go to the supermarket. They design supermarkets to torture parents. That is the number one design of the supermarket. They make sure that all of the stuff the kids are not supposed to have is low <laughs> and in plain eyesight. So my wife will send me to the store to get something uh, wholesome, 
you know, arugula or something, <laughs> and be shot by what we return with. <laughs> but I say it's not my fault. It's not my fault because, first of all, there's a the design of the building. They put all the low stuff, all the cookies and stuff down at the bottom. But it's even worse than that. Have you ever looked at one of those brownie boxes? <laughs> Think about this. Brownie boxes on the front of the brownie box have the most beautiful brownie ever born. <laughs> right there on the front. It's glistening. You can almost smell the brownie. You can practically taste the brownie. And once your child sees the front of that brownie box, it is impossible for you to get to the car without the brownie box. The brownie box, why? Because once the child sees the brownie box, he shows the brother, and then he shows you, and then you're looking at the brownie box. <laughs> you know what they don't do when they put the brownie boxes out? They don't show you the back of the brownie box. What's on the back of the brownie box? Directions, ingredients. Right? There should be some Surgeon General warnings on the back of the brownie box. Right? A lot of stuff, a lot of data, a lot of information. Right? That's our problem. When we're trying to persuade people, when we're trying to deal with the design of democracy that might let us change some of the designs of the system that would get us to the outcomes we want, we tend to start with the back of the brownie box. We show up, we would never sell any brownies. <laughs> because we would be so impressed <laughs> with our command of the back of the brownie box. Look at all of these cool ingredients and facts and data and stuff. And I think it's time for us to do a better job of talking about the front of the brownie box. What is the kind of country we would have? What kind of country would we have if the ideas that move us were able to move our democracy forward? What would it be like? What would it feel like? What would it look like? And you're, those of you who are in design understand the importance of aesthetics, but somehow a part of our brain tends to shut off when we try to engage the public. And we, uh, either bore or scare people. So <laughs> I want to suggest, I, I, rather than doing my spiel, what I want to do, since we're all friends here, uh, I wanted to try to shed a little light on the kinds of audiences that I talk to. And this trying to follow the injunction of my father to take complicated things and make them simple, but also learning from my children that being able to visualize and emotionally connect with an outcome uh, overwhelms every other uh, uh, barrier to action. And I want to talk with you about how I've been trying to do that. I think we can have a green economy in America. I think we, we can have more work, more wealth, and better health if we put people to work in the green sections of the, of the economy. And I think we can uh, have a, a, a big majority across both parties, and people aren't in any parties. These young people don't even care about the parties anymore. Um, we could have a transpartisan majority on this, but we're going to have to uh, show them the front of the brownie box. So seven different publics that I sometimes talk to, and I think some of you will sometimes have to talk to, and how I talk to them about the clean energy agenda, which is a part of the overall green economy agenda. Number one, libertarians. Now you ask, what would Van Jones know about libertarians? <laughs> well, I, was, I just in case anybody missed an episode, I served in the White House for about six months. <laughs> uh, the best six months of my life, followed by the worst two weeks. So <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google me. But I got a chance to come in contact with a lot of libertarians um, in that period and um, in this group called the Tea Party. And uh, their view of the president's environmental agenda was not very favorable. And um, I had to learn 
uh, how to communicate with them. So I'm going to share with you my spiel for libertarians, and then we'll go through a few other publics, and hopefully this will help you in your life going forward. The first thing I say to libertarians and trying to get them on board with our clean energy agenda is simply this. Don't you like liberty? <laughs> it's hard for them to say no. Even to me, you know? <laughs> Actually, yes. Well, I say, well, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. If you like liberty, why are you content to have your fellow countrymen and women be energy serfs for the rest of their lives? Be forced to be energy consumers in this country and never allowed to be energy producers. Why shouldn't every American have the right and the liberty to put a solar panel on their roof, to put a wind turbine out back, and sell that power they create onto a free and open smart grid and compete with anybody in the, in, in the United States uh, on the free market? Why are they forced? Why are they dictated to by power companies, by energy companies, that 12 times a year, tell them how much they're going to pay for their energy. Tell them how many asthma inhalers is going to be in their community as a result. And are never given the liberty to power their own homes, to power their own, own neighbor, neighbors, neighborhoods, and to participate in a free market in energy. We don't have a free market in energy in this country. Uh, uh, I happen to like free markets. I like them so much, I like to see one in our energy system. Um, showing the little bit of the brownie box. People can see that. They can imagine what it would be like to have uh, what the president's been talking about, which is you know, having a national smart grid, which would let you produce clean energy electrons in our clean energy power centers, like the, the Plain States, where we have wind, wind turbines going or could have them going, and move those electrons to our population centers and begin to run the country on clean energy. But if you talk about it at a level of abstraction around climate reduction, it's very hard to understand what an incredibly democratizing and empowering agenda that could actually be. Um, I talk about, sometimes I have to talk to climate skeptics. Um, here's what I don't talk to them about. Cap and trade. Um, not because it's not a good policy, uh, we could argue about that, but because it's a policy that sits on a principle that we don't defend or explain. But it's a principle that people across the political perspective embrace. What's the principle? The principle is very simple. Nobody in America should be able to pollute for free. Nobody should be able to pollute for free in America. So I often say, the first thing I say is, listen, you know, do we have any small business owners here? Yes, often it is. Let me ask you a question. If you, as a small business owner, were to take on Wednesday morning, every week, your trash and your refuse and walk out into the street, dump it there, turn around and walk back into your establishment and close the door. What might happen? You know what would happen? You would get a knock on the door. It would be some governmental authority figure saying to you, sir, <laughs> ma'am, you can't just throw your trash and your refuse out into the street, you've got to pay to have that hauled away, or you'll pay a fine. You couldn't then say to said governmental authority, au contraire. It's key to my business model. <laughs> you are a job 
killer. You would be called a cad or something much worse. Why? Because we're all neighbors here. You can't even walk down the street and pollute for free. If you take a gum wrapper out of your pocket, roll it up, toss it over your shoulder into the path of oncoming police officer, <laughs> you will get a fine. Why? You can't pollute America. Not for free. And when the, the officer gives you that $25 fine, you know what she'll say to that officer? Thank you. You're not really, but you should, right? Because it keeps us safe and civilized. We can't pollute for free. Well, if you got a $25 ticket, sir or ma'am, for throwing a gum wrapper on the sidewalk, you would be paying $25 more than any of our big polluters who right now are dumping megatons of carbon into the atmosphere and other stuff, and don't have to pay a penny for it, for that privilege. We don't think anybody should be able to pollute for free in America. Now, how do you get about pricing it? We can talk about that later. But that's showing people a little bit of the visuals there. What it would it be like in any other part of our society if people were able to pollute for free? and without consequence. I often talk to people who are in labor unions, who are um, in urban areas, who feel that the environmental agenda will stop them from working. To them, I talk about windmills. Actually, I don't talk to them about windmills. First of all, I ask them how many people think we need more windmills in America. And they always raise their hand. You know why? Because even they know it's politically correct. So let's see, how many of you think we should have more windmills in America? They all go, mm, okay. And I say, I don't. I don't think we need any more windmills in America. And any politician who tells you we do need windmills in America, you feel free to show them the door. We don't need any windmills in America. This is not Holland. This is not 1852. <laughs> what we need in America is wind turbines. Wind turbines. Totally different technology. Right? Imagine a wind turbine. 8,000 finely machined parts. That's a car. Boeing level engineering a jet engine in the sky, as much steel as in 20 cars. You could put your steel workers back to work and your automakers back to work, just building wind turbines to catch, catch and capture the Saudi Arabia of wind energy we have right here on our continent. You could put your steel workers back to work and your automakers back to work, building wind turbines for the Plain States. And off our coast and up in the Great Lake area. And the great thing about those wind turbines, which take a, a little gentle breeze and turn it into clean energy and power, is that if you build wind turbine platforms off our oceans, and one of those platforms goes down, you don't have a massive wind slick that comes and messes up the whole shoreline, you know. You know, that's not. The outcomes, just a big oopsie. Yeah. It's a smarter way to power the country and more jobs. Right? So I don't want you building wind, wind mills. I want you building wind turbines. Right? Sometimes I have to talk to rural audiences who really don't understand a lot of what we're talking about and often think when I talk about solar energy and wind energy that I'm talking about hippie power. He said, solar, wind, that's hippie power. If you put folks from Berserkly, <laughs> I have to tell them, it's funny you should say that. You know what it really is? It's cowboy power, rancher power, farmer power, 
where do you think we're going to deploy all these wind turbines and solar farms? Probably not in Manhattan. We may build some of that stuff in the so-called blue states, but a real clean energy agenda would, put, would let rural America earn three paychecks, new paychecks that they don't have right now. Imagine the plot of land that you have, trying to hold on to it. You put one wind turbine up there, you get ten to $15,000 per year just to watch it turn. How many farms are you going to lose once you've got that in place? You've got to have a grid to support it. Ten to $15,000 just to watch it turn. That's only one paycheck. Second paycheck. Imagine supplementing your food crop with some kind of energy crop. Hopefully not corn, but there's algae and other stuff. Chopra, Chopra, I always say it the wrong way. Um, so you could be not only selling food, but fuel. Second paycheck, third paycheck. Imagine using the advanced agricultural techniques that your grandparents used to capture carbon in the soil. And then trading that service on the carbon markets, three paychecks. We're not trying to take anything away from you. We're trying to get you, give you the opportunity to earn three paychecks holding on to your family farm in front of the brownie box. Sometimes I talk to people who really, because they live in poverty, especially urban poverty, really don't understand this eco agenda at all. And they say, well, you know, it's just for the eco elite. Uh, it's for those people who, who can go to Whole Foods <laughs> in their hybrid cars. It has nothing to do with me. I say, well, why do you say that? I say, well, you know, Whole Food. That's like Whole Paycheck. I can't go to Whole Food. Uh, come out with one strawberry. <laughs> I'm healthy, but I'm hungry. This is not, <laughs> it's not my agenda. Uh, I say, no, you know, you may not see it the right way yet. If you think about it the right way, the green economy is not just a place for people who have wealth and, got, thank goodness they do, to spend money. It can also be a place for people of modest means to earn money and save money. Let's talk about energy efficiency. And I, especially when I'm talking to young people in urban environments and, and their parents, they get this really quickly. I say, hold on a second. Let me, let's not talk about solar panels. You guys may not be buying any solar panels today. Let me talk to you not about those sexy solar panel dollars. Let's talk about those humble, hardworking energy efficiency dollars. The most humble, hardworking dollars in our economy are energy efficiency dollars. What am I talking about? If you're unemployed, I can take one dollar for energy efficiency and give it to you. Now, that dollar, I've just employed you. You stand up. That dollar just cut unemployment. But it's just getting started. You walk across the street to weatherize and retrofit grandmama's house. You're blowing in that clean, non-toxic insulation. You're replacing those windows and doors that are vibrating in the pain. Every vibration is energy escaping, costing more money with some good new windows. You're taking out those old boilers and furnaces that have been in there 20, 30, 40 years, and you're putting in some new efficient stuff. Well, you're doing that work. That same dollar that cut unemployment now has just cut grandmama's energy bill maybe by 30%, maybe by 40%. That dollar's still working, why? Because if you cut grandmama's energy bill by 30%, there's usually a coal-fired power plant somewhere that's having to work overtime because everybody's houses are so leaky and inefficient, well, you just cut pollution by 30%, which means you just cut asthma by 30%. And if you finance it right, the savings that grandmama gets can be used, can be used to pay off that work. So rather than it costing money, that dollar is helping grandma save money, helping the unemployed person earn money. You're recycling dollars. That's good for the earth. It's also good for this community. Now, that's the kind of green economics that people can understand. You're going to give Pookie a job. Pookie needs a job. You're going to cut grandmama's energy bill. You're going to take the asthma inhalers out of my little girl's pocket. I'm for you. You can imagine that community with people working. Again, people care about work, wealth, and health. 
if you can put that kid to work, if you can save money and help build wealth, and you can take the asthma inhalers out of that, that, that little girl's pocket, you're, you're showing people a little bit of the front of that brownie box. Just two more, and then I'll close. I sometimes talk to people. This will shock you here in Northern California who are religious. <laughs> He's like, no! <laughs> I am myself a person of faith, and um, on the cosmopolitan coasts where so much environmental discussion happens, uh, there's sometimes a little bit of an allergy to uh, people of faith. And we miss huge opportunities. Uh, when I talk, I can't wait. I love talking to religious communities about this agenda because uh, one of the first things I can remember my grandmother ever saying was to me and my cousin, when we were doing something, I can't remember what it was, but I remember her reaction. She said, what on God's green earth are you doing? God's green earth. See, I was born with this stuff. See? <laughs> what on God's green earth are you doing? Well, there's a reason for that. You know, I often ask people, I say, well, listen, you, 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 you're, you're, we're all good people of faith here. Uh, I imagine you love God. I imagine you love the creator. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, I don't believe you. That's a good trick. <laughs> I don't believe you. I say, why? People get upset. I don't, believe, I don't believe that you love the creator. I said, let me ask you a question. How many of you have a mother? <laughs> you got to find common ground on this stuff. How many of you have a mother? Everybody. Well, let me ask you a question. Can you go to your mother's house Thanksgiving? Give her a big old hug, big old kiss. Say, Mama, I love you. And then turn around, walk into the living room, put your muddy feet up on the sofa, uh, spill your beer on the rug, and just gently start tearing the place up. How long would you survive doing that? People debate about the number of seconds they would last, you know. Why? Because you can't love. What you can say is, listen, this is my house. Don't tell me you love me and then come mess up my house. If you love me, respect what I made. I made this house, not for you to come tear it up. And if you, you can't tell me you love me and act this way. That's true about your mo mom. It's true about Mother Nature. It's true about the, any creator of anything. If you want to show you don't respect and love that creator, mess up their creation. Mess up their creation. And that's what we're doing down here. Messing up creation. And we could de redesign everything and respect creation, still have all our cool iPods and stuff, but we could respect creation, and we're not doing it. Imagine what we would teach our young people about our awe and our respect and our reverence for the creator if we said that God didn't make any junk. We don't have any throwaway species and people. That might be a better witness. Last thing I'll say is I sometimes run into people who love America. Hopefully, it's everybody in this room. And there is a mistaken belief. And again, I'm trying to get the design of democracy to work, which means we got to have a majority of people, not just a bare majority, but a super majority, not just in one party, but in both and all parties and no parties, that can understand why we can move in a direction that's green to give us more wealth, uh, more work, and better health. But sometimes we skip over something, which is that all of this ha is happening and taking place in a country not just on the earth in general, but in a country in particular, and a country that has uh, people with justifiable pride in some of the things we've achieved here. And when we don't 
pay honor and respect to the country, we leave ourselves vulnerable to people saying that we actually don't like this country very much. You know, you can't lead anything or anybody that you don't love. There's an iron rule. You can't lead a country you don't love. We can't lead this country in a green direction. Not everything we say about America is like, you know, how much it sucks. Not, not saying you say this, but you, you met some people. Everything about America, all oh, these, oh, America, I can't wait to get to Europe, you know, because. Like, it just doesn't work because, you know, and you, you can't go into your company and say, all of you people suck. <laughs> now, do what I say. <laughs> Even if it's the best advice in the world, you wouldn't take it. Right? But somebody comes in and says, this is a great company. I want to make it better. Right? You'll listen. You know why? Because that person is called a consultant. <laughs> You'll pay for that person to talk and be glad you did. Why? Because the first thing they say is, you're great, you can be greater. And that's true about this country. We're great, and we could be greater. You know, we, we're an extraordinary country, we're born with this strange contradiction. We had a founding reality that was ugly and unequal. Even the founders themselves had some disappointment. Jefferson himself, at the founding moment, look at the founding reality. He said, I tremble for my country when I think that God is just. He's thinking about the enslavement, thinking about so many things that they weren't able to get right at the beginning. The founding reality. Ugly, unequal. But America is more than our founding reality. We also had a founding dream. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal. And who we are as Americans, imperfect people, a rainbow people, every generation trying to move that founding reality closer to the beauty of that founding dream. That's who we are. That's all that we are. You see, any, any Olympic team in the world, if China's team comes out, you say, well, yep, they look like China. Kenya's team comes out, yep, they look like Kenya. America's team comes out, we look like everybody. But we're Americans, why? Because we are those people unique in this world, imperfect as we are, that keep trying to get a step closer to that founding dream. And it's in that quest, we're never gonna be perfect, but we can have a more perfect union. It's in that quest that this idea of America the beautiful has such resonance. And the design of democracy somehow has to be reconsidered so it can meet up with the demands of America the beautiful now. America the beautiful today can't waste water and resources and, and, and pollute the air and leave people out and leave people behind. America the Beautiful today uh, can be better than that, can be truer than that. Uh, we have the ideas now at the level of design. I think uh, the opportunity that we have today is to put our hand, arms around the whole country. We're not going to win left versus right on this thing. Uh, I know that because I was in, in Washington, D.C. when I saw the clash and the crash and the inability to put forward common sense proposals in common ground language. Uh, I am proud to be the son of Willie Anthony Jones who served this country. I'm proud to be the father of Cabral and Machai. Uh, and I teach them to sing that song, America the Beautiful. And I teach them as their responsibility to defend America's beauty, to uphold America's beauty. And if we can all stand together on that simple refrain, I think we will be able to have a country with liberty and justice for all. And I think we can make people like my father and my sons very proud. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Van, so much for that inspiring, uh, inspiring talk. I think m many, many people in this room are faced with the kind of diversity of audiences that you talked about, and um, and and many of us love data um, and very complicated visuals as well. Um, in fact, we get really excited about that, um, and it's it's I think uh, it's it's extraordinarily important to take your message to heart. Not only the broader message, but the uh, the message about how we relate to everyone in our everyday lives and our professions because we really do want to make change and many of the kinds of changes that you're talking about. And I think that um, that's really one of the goals of the College of Environmental Design, to train people not only about the technical aspects of what they do and how to make America and other places beautiful, but also um, how to talk to people and engage people and, and help them to understand the kind of path that we might uh, have moving forward. So thank you very much. Thanks, Van. Uh, I want to now thank everybody for coming and uh, ask everybody to get ready to party. Uh, and um, I also want everybody to give a big hand, final hand to the distinguished alums who I am so proud of and I know so many faculty and students uh, are also deeply proud of. And I, uh, it's a very, very special day for us all. So Bill, Shelley, John, congratulations. Thank you.